going to talk about some of the techniques I have learnt over the years to build, uh, to basically hack our MVPs uh, to basically figure out how to get validated learning as quickly as possible. Uh, the funny thing is uh, you met Amy this morning's keynote, uh, uh, keynote speaker. She actually used to run something called as uh, MVP design hacks. And so she's like, you stole my topic. I'm like, no, I've been doing this before you were doing it. So it's interesting. We will see. Uh, let's look at some quick, interesting startups. All right. These are two startups that I uh, kind of know. Has anyone heard of Greenlight? Chances are no. Greenlight is this company based out of Mumbai. A uh, bunch of people from, uh, quit Google from Silicon Valley, came back, and they wanted to do something with a social cause. And they looked at, uh, you know, 2 billion people still use dangerous, expensive kerosene lamps. Right? Everyone's familiar with the kerosene lamps? And their vision was to bring clean energy, uh, clean energy to the world. So these guys are obviously extremely smart guys, and they built what you see here, uh, these kind of solar uh, lights, uh, and it was cost. It, it was about uh, 950 rupees. Uh, if anything gets damaged, you can replace it. No questions asked. It can be very rough use. You can th take it, throw it, all of that stuff. And they, they put a fantastic product together. In my opinion, at 950 rupees, uh, it's a fabulous product. And when they went out to market, uh, what did they see? Oh, people had 950 rupees for sure, uh, but people were not willing to buy. Adoption was not there, right? Uh, why, why you think there wouldn't be adoption for such a fantastic product? <clears throat> Zero maintenance, because it's all solar, right? And if anything goes wrong, you get a free replacement. The first problem that villagers found, and their target audience was villagers, is that they didn't think what they were using was expensive or hazardous. We've always been using kerosene lamps. Houses didn't burn off, right? Why is it expensive or hazardous? Villagers were afraid of technology product. This is a technology product, right? They are afraid of those technology products. They simply lack awareness on some of these aspects, right? And so, with the best of their intent, these guys put out something over there, and it didn't really get traction. But, of course, these guys are smart individuals, and what they did is they went out and they did a lot of study. They did a lot of, uh, you know, customer interactions to try and understand why, you know, uh, why aren't people buying this? Because this is, this is absolutely something you should be buying. Uh, and what they found is that when they started talking to people, people said, you know, solar uh, light is fine, but actually what I really need is uh, something to charge my mobile phone. And these guys are like, huh, that's an interesting problem, right? All these villages have mobile phones, but they don't have a way to charge the mobile phone because electricity is gone for many hours together. And so they did a pivot. They did a big pivot, and they basically added one new feature to their uh, solar light, and that feature was about uh, ability to charge mobile phones. And then they had what is referred to as the hockey stick growth, right? Today, they light up uh, 1 lakh, 100,000 villages uh, in, in India and in Africa, right? Pretty amazing uh, adoption. And suddenly, people started using the light. What's the moral of the story? More features are better. Brilliant. <laughs> I know you're trying to. Let's look at another example to kind of uh, draw some more correlation. Does anyone know about Eureka Forbes? It's the company that's known in India for vacuum cleaners first and then water purifiers. Right? Their vision, again, was to bring clean water to people. Right? Uh, clean water to people because Groundwater is polluted in a lot of places. And this is a product that they launched in the urban parts of India, in the metro cities, 
and again was a very popular product, lots of people using Eureka Forbes. But if they were to take this product and go to the villages, would it work? Why not? Power supply is okay, but where is the water that your users want, right? A friend of mine, Jeff Patton, he came up with this diagram. I love this. Uh, and he says, this is how I think about design thinking. I have a big idea. I have a big idea, which is basically I want to change the world. I want to bring clean energy to people, et cetera, et cetera. I'm going to build a big prototype that I'm going to then use to run a bunch of tests with actual users. And then I'm going to have a list of learnings from it which I'm going to then feed it back into this big idea and I'm going to iterate over this cycle till I finally figure out what actually works for my users, right? Yeah, this is oversimplification of design thinking, but uh, I, I think this is a quite accurate representation of how design thinking works. Uh, the time from learning to validation can be long is basically the problem with this approach. And this is where I think the lean startup is slightly different uh, in, in terms of the approach that we take, right? So we have a big idea. Again, we start, oops, we start with a big idea. Uh, we list down all the big assumptions that we have, the user assumptions, the solution assumptions, the other kinds of assumptions. From that, we distill down what's our riskiest assumption, what's going to kill us, right? What's the riskiest assumption? We pick one riskiest assumption, we create a hypothesis around it, we design an experiment, and we build a simple prototype or any, you know, I would call that as an MVP uh, to figure out a focus test. We would get a small learning from it, but important learning, and then we iterate through this process. And the idea is how quickly can you go from, uh, you know, how quickly can you complete this cycle? And that's what makes uh, Lean Startup slightly different from the design thinking, even though we build a, a lot on the same principles and ideas. Uh, the, the question here is how quickly can you go through the build, measure, learn cycle? So a lot of my remaining talk is going to be about how do we do this in very short cycles and what hacks can we put in place to do this. So I'm going to use some of my own examples and some examples from other people to you know, go through this cycle very quickly. That was all the context so far of what this is going to be about, right? So we talked about some examples of uh, startups which found a latch, eventually figured it out. They could have applied design thinking, but that would have been a big cycle. If you applied lean startup, that would probably shorten the cycle. Now let's talk about some real practical ways of doing this. How many, how many people here are familiar with the definition of minimum viable product? I hope everyone should be familiar with. What's the definition of minimum viable product? Absolutely wrong. Absolutely wrong. Something doesn't have to be features. Something that validates your riskiest assumptions, riskiest hypothesis. Could be your growth hypothesis or could be your value hypothesis. So there are two kinds of hypothesis, right? If you look at the definition of a minimum viable product, it's a version of a new product which allows a team to collect maximum amount of validated learning uh, about the customer with the least effort. The problem with this definition is it has the word new product. And immediately people start thinking about features. People start thinking about an actual product. While what I'm going to focus a lot on is you don't need to build a product, you don't need to build features. What you want is to maximize your validated learning with as little cost as possible, right? Uh, so let's, uh, let's look at a video which demonstrates this point beautifully of what is actually an MVP. Uh, do I have sound on this? So my name is Paul Howe. I'm going to talk about a specific technique that my startup has used to conduct really realistic, really effective user tests of, of our ideas. So about a year ago, we had an idea for a social purchase sharing app 
where you would stream out what you're buying to your friends and they would share back with you what they were buying and it was going to be great and it was going to be a, a social networking take on product reviews. And being a lean startup, we mocked it up, static prototypes, we got it in front of a lot of people and, and they said, you know, I'm not going to use it, but I could see how other people might use it. And then we heard that again and again. And we said, well, well, why wouldn't you use it? And they said, because I don't know which of my friends would actually use this. And it made sense. It's a social application. And if they don't see the real faces of their friends that they can emotionally connect with, they can't actually grok what it's going to be about. So I said, all right, we need to to make this a more realistic test than what we've done. And we drilled down on the most important interaction on the site, which is when someone does a purchase and shares it on Facebook and it appears in, in their friend's news feed. And we were interested, would people actually click? Would they care? So we thought about, uh, you know, how can we make this realistic? Do we have to build the whole thing and build this pretty serious sized app to do this, or could we fake it really well? We decided to try to fake it, and the technique we used was a GreaseMonkey script. So if you're not familiar with GreaseMonkey, it's just a simple little JavaScript that can change the way a website appears. So, so here's an Amazon product page. After I installed GreaseMonkey, it now pops up every time I go there, a little yellow box that shows competitors' prices. So um, it's specific to one page, and, and it alters that page. So. I went on rentacoder.com, described what I wanted. I found a guy in the Philippines who was willing to build our script for $40. We sent our $40 across the ocean. <laughs> and a few days later, sure enough, back came the script. And it's pretty simple. There's the whole thing right there. You just drag that into Chrome or to Firefox, and it wakes up every time it gets on its target page. So every time we went to Facebook, it would wake up and it would run itself. So the next thing we do, is our standard procedure. We post an ad on Craigslist, say we're running a social media focus group, we bring people in, so what's your favorite social media site? And invariably they'd say Facebook. We'd say, great, why don't you log into Facebook? That's a great idea. And up would pop their newsfeed, and they're feeling totally in control, seems very realistic. Their newsfeed pops up, and the Grease Monkey script runs, and it inserts fake content into their feed, and it's using their real friends' names and faces. So it's pixel perfect real. If we built the whole thing, it wouldn't have looked any different than that. And so then we sat back and said, well, are they going to notice this content that our app would normally insert into their feed? And sure enough, no prompting, they were like, well, wait a minute, my friend Michelle bought a Lady Gaga album, and my friend Charlie bought, you know, an iPad, and they noticed, and they reacted very strongly. <laughs> I hated it. This is, how, this is how Facebook is going to hell. It used to be about friends, and now it's about commercial stuff. Uh, I remember back in the day, we would share poetry, and now I hate these ads. Uh, and we did it 50 times, and there were three people who liked it. So it was a very different reaction than when we did the initial prototypes. And it really wasn't that hard to do. Uh, you know, it's a $40 script. So that's my main point. It All right, I'm going to jump ahead, but you get the point, right? Uh, what was the riskiest assumption? If, if people look at other people buying stuff and that appearing in the news feed automatically, would people actually, uh, you know, get influenced to, to buy? And they didn't have to build a way to actually validate this. And actually, if I had played the video longer, you could see that uh, you know, they had two other competitors at the same time who went all gangbusters. They raised money, they, they, they raised $100 million, and they went all gangbusters. And about nine months later, the first company declared that this idea was a bad idea, and they, they're basically shutting down. The second company also decided the same thing, that it's a bad idea, they're shutting it down. While these guys were pivoting and they found something else, they called it trend feed, uh, and then they, they took off. Unfortunately, after two years, even they died. <laughs> uh, but they were, they were at least there for two years while the rest of them actually died much earlier. Uh, but the thing was they were able to avoid a bunch of uh, wastage, which others were. The next slide that I had was about Zappos. How many people know Zappos? Uh, a lot of people have uh, familiar. Zappos was bought by Amazon a few years ago. What was Zappos' story?
So Zappos, the idea was that is the market ready to buy shoes online? And his hunch was that yes, people are ready, they will buy shoes online, provided you give a great experience, right? And so he posted ads on Craigslist, people started buying stuff. Uh, he would go, he basically went to the local store, took pictures of the thing, put it on Craigslist, people would buy it, he would ship it together. Then he realized people want returns, right? And then he would, when he shipped it, he also would ship uh, the ability for people to, uh, you know, return shoes back. And what he noticed is most people were not just ordering one shoes, they were ordering two or three shoes, and they would keep one and they would send two or three back. So a lot of that discovery happened early, very early, and then when they actually set up the entire process, this is how. Zappos also has a famous story of a lady misusing, uh, has anyone read of that story? So there was this lady who would buy shoes, wear it for 29 days and return it back. Uh, or wear it for a few parties and then return it back. And Zappos took a call that they are not going to change the process uh, even if someone's misusing it. Right? And that's why I think Zappos became very popular for their customer support and the culture. And that came again from the founder and the way he, you know, he had empathy for users. Uh, but a lot of that happened through his early discovery in this thing. Let's look at another example real quick and then we will jump into some of my own examples. Hi, I'm Mike, founder of DollarShaveClub.com. What is DollarShaveClub.com? Well, for a dollar a month, we send high quality razors right to your door. Yeah, a dollar. Are the blades any good? No. Our blades are f***ing great. Each razor has stainless steel blades and aloe vera lubricating strip and a pivot head. It's so gentle a toddler could use it. And do you like spending $20 a month on brand name razors? 19 go to Roger Federer. I'm good at tennis. And do you think your razor needs a vibrating handle, a flashlight, a back scratcher, and 10 blades? Your handsome ass grandfather had one blade and polio. Looking good, pop up. Stop paying for shave tech you don't need. And stop forgetting to buy your blades every month. Alejandro and I are gonna ship them right to you. We're not just selling razors, we're also making new jobs. Alejandro, what were you doing last month? Not working. What are you doing now? Working. I'm no Vanderbilt, but this train makes hay. So stop forgetting to buy your blades every month and start deciding where you're going to stack all those dollar bills I'm saving you. We are DollarShaveClub.com, and the party is on. Year 2012, uh, I believe 2012, uh, the most viral video on internet. Uh, 36,000 people signed up in the first week of watching this ad. Before, is it, is basically, I think we spent uh, $11,000 uh, to make the entire video and put it online. Uh, he himself acted in the video. He did uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So again, kind of applying all the team thinking over there. And what was the hypothesis this guy was trying to validate with the video? Well, people would be interested in getting something like this. Some people would be join a dollar to a dollar. Yes, a little bit more. Would they order razors over the internet? The key, the key hypothesis here is nineteen dollars Gillette shaving blade, one dollar Dollar Shave Club blades, one dollar cheap stuff. I'm not going to use it. $19, great quality. It's very human that we associate price with quality, right? So can he break that? That was his main hypothesis, right? Would people discard this if it's $1 is too cheap and then associate with bad quality, right? So can I break that cycle? That's the first hypothesis. The second hypothesis was, there's a certain rate at which you consume shaving blades. It's quite predictable. 
So can we just predict that and ship it to you instead of you having to forget going and buying blades? Right? And would people want that convenience? Right? So there were two hypotheses that uh, Mike was trying to validate through this video. And that's kind of what he did. And he put a simple landing page for people to go sign up and buy stuff. Uh, did he have a warehouse? Did he have supply chain management figured out? Answer is yes. Uh, Dollar Shave Club existed before even he made the video, but there were no takers. And this was, the video was basically the point where he actually really took off, right? So sometimes it's again about finding a cheap way to actually connect with people and make something funny and cool and, you know, make it such that people will connect with you and be able to go and buy your stuff. Now there are 50 other Dollar Shave Club mimics, right? So he's disrupted the complete market. And that's, that's, to me, a case of a great success. I've done something similar, like, you know, quick Google Forms to see how many people are interested and then convert it into a more full-fledged site and stuff like that to validate some ideas. This is a pretty common hack a lot of people do is just start with a simple form, see how many people are interested, and then kind of make a full-blown site or other kinds of things. Uh, the, another startup that I was involved with, uh, and I'm going to spend a little bit of time kind of talking about that, and our idea was to basically help kids learn mental arithmetics. This is at Adventure Labs, one of my previous startup, and our idea was to basically help kids learn mental arithmetics, and Abacus was, the, was one of the tools that we found that, you know, a lot of people in India, about 100,000 people every year in India, uh, go through Abacus classes. They learn Abacus to get good at mental arithmetics. Uh, my partner, his two daughters had done it, and they were faster than a calculator, so you can throw 100 random numbers at them, and they will multiply it every time you throw a new number at them, as fast as you can, you know, much faster than you can do it in a calculator. And so we thought this is really powerful, but the problem with this physical abacus is that it doesn't give you pinpointed feedback, and it's not customized, uh, it's not adaptive in terms of the pace at which someone can go through. If someone's fast, they can't go as fast as they want, because it's controlled by the class, right? So that's kind of what we were trying to do. And our original idea was to build uh, actually an electronic abacus that will solve this problem, right? But we did a 3D modeling. We hired some people, and we figured out that this is going to be a fairly expensive process of building these models, of actually building this real electronic abacuses, getting it out to people, validating that it actually helps, and then bringing it back uh, to, to complete the cycle. So we came up with the idea of why not pick an off-the-shelf. Uh, we looked on the iPad App Store. Uh, we, we found that there is a bunch of uh, these uh, iPad-based uh, abacuses. Can we just use that to validate our hypothesis? That will, will giving pinpointed feedback help uh, kids learn faster? Right? So we tried this, and the answer was actually people were able to pick up. So on, in a class, it took three weeks for kids to learn all the numbers on the abacus. Give any number, how to represent on the abacus, take three weeks. On the iPad, it took them about a week. So what we found is actually th this pinpointed feedback is actually helping kids validate stuff. And we went on to do a bunch of other things, you know, adding gamification, adding some kind of a sense of purpose so that they can com keep coming back and doing things. Uh, adaptive learning. Uh, I'm just skipping a bunch of these things. Uh, I'm just kind of showing how we evolved over a period of time. We went through seven pivots before we realized. This was an interesting experiment where our hypothesis was that if, uh, not a, a, a hypothesis, forget the hypothesis. We wanted to basically uh, have the kids practice 10 minutes every day. If the kids don't practice 10 minutes every day, then some of the power of this abacus falls off, right? So how do we ensure that the kids will keep coming back every day? And so we introduce this character, and you have to feed the character, else the character would die. Right? So you have to come in and feed the character every day, and this is, again, something that we actually give uh, pets to different kids to validate if you know, they would actually take care. And what we found is most of the kids were very attached, and they would actually feed and things like that. So we said, can we have an electronic version of that? Right? And so you have to feed this, but if you have to feed, you have to have enough points to feed the character. And to get points, you have to practice. Right? So we kind of tried to connect all of these, and we actually ran that experiment again. So what I'm talking about is in a startup, you're not going to do one MVP. You're going to do many MVPs. 
and there is a constant MVP that's going on in the startup. Uh, another one was around a lot of kids drop off after three months of this because they don't see any real improvements. And how do you visualize the improvement? So what we did is we put this fake you know, this is basically your thinking ability is improved and your memory is improved by so much percent. Right? It's just a fake thing. And what we saw is kids kept coming back and looking at this. Right? So again, ways of uh, gamifying things to engage people more. Uh, I'm going to skip some of these. We actually, uh, once we had the basic idea flushed out, right? at this point we've not really built any software. Uh, we just were randomly experimenting a lot of different things, and that took us about a year, right? It, it took us about a year to just keep experimenting and figuring out these things. And then we went to some potential big guys in this space because we are nobody in the education space. If we went out and put a product out there, guess what? Nobody's going to care for it, uh, which we knew beforehand. So we had, uh, you know, we had thought about the channels, how we're going to distribute this, and we said we're going to tie up with one of the big guys. We had a list of 13 companies that we said we we're going to tie up with. We started right on the top of the list, went through every single company, everyone rejected us. Uh, and the reason for rejection was that this looks fantastic, but it's too futuristic. This is not going to work. Can you give me this on a Windows machine? And we're like, no, this only works on a tablet. They're like, no, 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 this is too futuristic. So he said, screw this. We're going to take a small version of it. We're going to spend two weeks and we're going to build a, a small game which has the basic elements of this, and we're going to put it on the App Store. Uh, this was in 2012, and our target market was India. Because, so our original target market was Asians in, in US, the rich guys in the US because they think of education as investment, while the other guys think of education as expenses, right? Uh, so we targeted Asian, but every person we spoke to, they said, how, how do you target Asian origin parents in, in US? If you figure that out, let us know, because a Google ad will cost you $3 per acquisition, right? So we said, okay, backing off, we, we, we can't. So let's focus on India. India didn't have, in 2012, India didn't have the tablet penetration in general. You did have the cheap tablets, but the cheap tablets are not good enough for an experience like this. Uh, so that's why a lot of people felt this was too futuristic. But we felt like, you know, how do we hack that? How do we prove that their market exists? So we spent two weeks, we put together a simple game which has the basic elements. We put it on the App Store. And as you can see from here, uh, we had 100,000 downloads in the first week. We were number three on UAE and uh, in India App Store. So we went to, with these numbers to these guys, saying, you said that this is too futuristic, there's 100,000 downloads. What do you have to say about that? And they're like, OK, the real reason is this is going to sabotage our product. It's going to sabotage our business, because most of these guys, their business was franchisee model. And we're going to completely disrupt their franchisee model, right? So anyway, long story short, uh, we decided to scrap this because this is, this is a much bigger game. And by this time, we had burned enough money that we didn't want to pursue this. So we actually shut it down. Uh, but it was a great learning experience in terms of you know sometimes you have the right product, but you don't have the channel. Uh, and if you don't have the channel, then your product's not going to make it. right? So it boils back to the early story that I talked about. If you can't find the latch, the distribution channel, or whatever, how to connect with your users, uh, you might have a fantastic product, but it's not going to go anywhere. The interesting thing is we said, why not put it in the App Store? Because the App Store is doing well. Uh, so the next one we put in the App Store was $1. This was free. The next one we put in the App Store was $1. What was the response? Seven downloads. Like, OK, clearly, this is, we don't know how to crack this market, and we're not going to attempt doing that. So we backed off. We pulled off the startup. Uh, I'm going to skip my intro, because most of you know me by now. I'm going to jump straight to quick.
quick time check. How much time do I have? 10 minutes. Okay, perfect. That gives me time to talk about the moral of the story. Uh, so I talk about, you know, every entrepreneur, every startup, every, uh, you know, whoever wants to do something has some kind of a vision. And then you come up with a set of strategies that will help you achieve the vision. So for example, in our case, our vision was that kids can calculate faster than the calculator. They don't have to be born genius to do it. Uh, and it, you know, they can do it provided that you know, there's ways to do it. And one way was to building games so kids can do it. Another way is to going to classes where they teach you this stuff and you can learn. So there are many different strategies of achieving a vision. Right? You pick the, the most promising strategy of achieving the vision, and you come up with a list of hypotheses, a list of hypotheses that will help you achieve the vision. Right? For each hypothesis, you run a bunch of safe-fail validation, safe-fail experimentation. You have some validated learning out of it, which helps you tweak or improve your strategy, and then you go round and round till you have figured out What's the right connect or right click with the, with the audience? Yes? To have a vision, vision can be accomplished by multiple strategies. You pick the most promising strategy. You say, what are your hypotheses? Uh, you take each of your hypotheses. You take the riskiest hypothesis. You run a safe fail experiment. Uh, I talked about a bunch of different experiments we ran in. And then you come with some validated learning, which improves your strategy. I'm going to play another video real quick. Some of you might have seen this video, and then I'll connect the dots back once I have played the video. How do you explain when things don't go as we assume? Or better, how do you explain when others are able to achieve things that seem to defy all of the assumptions? For example, why is Apple so innovative? Year after year after year after year, they're more innovative than all their competition, and yet they're just a computer company. They're just like everyone else. They have the same access to the same talent, the same agencies, the same consultants, the same media. Then why is it that they seem to have something different? Why is it that Martin Luther King led the civil rights movement? He wasn't the only man who suffered in a pre-civil rights America, and he certainly wasn't the only great orator of the day. Why him? And why is it that the Wright brothers were able to figure out controlled powered man flight when there were certainly other teams who were better qualified, better funded, and they didn't achieve powered man flight, and the Wright brothers beat them to it. There's something else at play here. About three and a half years ago, I made a discovery, and this discovery profoundly changed my view on how I thought the world worked, and it even profoundly changed the way in which I operate in it. As it turns out, there's a pattern. As it turns out, all the great and inspiring leaders and organizations in the world, whether it's Apple or Martin Luther King or the Wright brothers, they all think, act, and communicate the exact same way, and it's the complete opposite to everyone else. All I did was codify it, and it's probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. Why, how, what? This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? And why should anyone care? Well, as a result, the way we think, the way we act, the way we communicate is from the outside in. It's obvious. We go from the clearest thing to the fuzziest thing. But the inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations regardless of their size, regardless of their industry, all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. I use Apple because they're easy to understand and everybody gets it. If Apple were like everyone else, 
a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Meh. And that's how most of us communicate. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. And that's how most of us communicate interpersonally. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better. And we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's our new law firm. Uh, we have the best lawyers with the biggest clients. We have, you know, we always perform for our clients, do business with us. Here's our new car. It gets great gas mileage. It has, you know, leather seats. Buy our car. But it's uninspiring. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user friendly. We just happen to make great computers. Want to buy one? Totally different, right? You're ready to buy a computer from me. All I did was reverse the order of the information. What it proves to us is that people don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. This explains why every single person in this room is perfectly comfortable buying a computer from Apple. But we're also perfectly comfortable buying an MP3 player from Apple, or a phone from Apple, or a DVR from Apple. But as I said before, Apple's just a computer company. There's nothing that distinguishes them structurally from any of their competitors. Their competitors are all equally qualified to make all of these products. It all right, you get the point, right? Yes, no? How many people had watched this video before? A lot of people. This is this is pretty common video out there. Uh, and I've watched it many times, and every time I watch it, there's, there's a different level of insight that comes out of the video in some sense. And so what I try to do is I try to take that and I try to map it to what the model earlier I was talking to, right? So you have a vision, you have multiple strategies, and then you go through a validated learning, uh, validated learning to actually come up with a product, right? The product is something that refines and gets optimized. The strategy is what you pivot on, right? And the vision is something that rarely changes because the vision is technically the why. So if you are a startup, if you are building a new product in a larger company, wherever it is, right, what should you focus on? A lot of us focus on the what. We focus on the features. We focus on the differentiating value proposition. Uh, but do we focus on the why? And so the point I'm trying to make here is that, in my opinion, your MVP, right, your series of MVP are about trying to figure out the why. And once you've figured out the why, then you can use a lot of lean startup techniques or other kinds of techniques, agile techniques, to figure out the how and the what, right? But the figuring out the why is extremely important, and that's something you need to do very early on. And it's something that is a continuous process. It doesn't stop with one, you know, one attempt. But if I were to summarize, you know, if we go back to the original definition of MVP, it's not about finding the minimum viable product that gives you validated learning. It's about uh, figuring out the cheapest technique to connect to the why of your doing something. And if you can figure that out early on, then the how and the what is, is rather you know, easier to figure out at a later point. Right? So that's kind of my big point about hacking MVP. So if your focus is on the why, uh, you'd be able to find lots of different techniques to cheaply figure out whether this is something that would resonate with people, if this is something that appeals to people. And then the how and what is something that you can figure out. Of course, there are a lot of books on this subject. And I'm sure you've seen that throughout the day. Uh, so if you're interested in any of these books, that's what it is. I'm pretty much done, uh, open for questions at this stage. No questions. Yeah. Well, not get away from get away from using kerosene lamps, but their client, their customers didn't really care about that. And then they actually got in there using a little trick of like, oh yeah, great, you have this feature of being able to charge my phone, that seems backwards to me, and I'm, I'm having trouble connecting that to, to what Simon is saying. So that's why I said that that was an expensive process. 
had they gone in there and tried to you know connect with people on the why before building anything right the 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 why is clean energy right and the clean energy the mvp could be is i'm going to give you something to charge your mobile phone right so had they focused on the why and being able to connect with the people of what part of my why is actually going to appeal to people and it could be charging mobile phones uh, and the clean energy uh, is something that would come in as as a part of that right so if 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 they were able to go in and do that early then they wouldn't have to build the whole product and then work backwards mm -hmm. uh, so the original case studies that i talked about were examples where it was not done in this fashion right and if they had done it in this fashion my hypothesis again it's my hypothesis that you know they would have hit what people wanted much faster and maybe a better product and maybe a series of product not just one product cuz your your why might actually be totally wrong or you, not really work with people is that what you're saying i think your why is something that people might not connect with and if you can you know figure out ways to to connect with people on the why then what your product is what features are are all secondary thank you that's that's the point i was trying to make any other questions that was a good question no the, that's the how no that's the how right the how is the value proposition the unique selling all of that stuff right the why is why should someone care do do you believe in the vision that we believe in dollars here guy right it's like i honestly believe something needs to be done about this thing right i honestly believe kinda, cheap yeah. is not bad quality exactly that right? I that's the why that. how i do it i happen to make razor blades i'm going to make something else i'm going to make something else and people will connect if they're sold on the why right the why for this conference for example why do we run this conference that in india we are different deserve to get right and one way to fulfill that is through running the conference now we run bunch of conferences not just this conference there are different kinds of conferences that we run right so the why is that i want exposure and i am deprived of exposure and i feel other people are deprived of exposure and we all can't afford to fly to other countries all the time to get that exposure right so can we do something about that that's the why the why doesn't talk about the product at all so uh why doesn't talk about the product at all uh i am i am thoda uh, slightly maybe confused because uh, uh, <clears throat> uh say i am going to start uh, there, there is a product idea uh, that i'm going to develop and uh, one of the best ways to get started to go and find people whom for whom it is instant value like who are like okay if you have this today okay i'm ready to willing to give you money why because they have a problem and you propose the solution now that solution might be a paper prototype or anything but uh, the starting point always is to find a niche of people to validate your idea the fact that okay somebody is willing to pay for that idea absolutely but step back why are you building this you could be building 20 things correct right there's a reason why you chose to pick this one thing correct and then second step is you're going to go and validate if this correct. is worth investing in correct or should i go to the 20 the next idea and invest time in that i mean i have 20 you have of hundreds ideas. of ideas yeah. everyone has hundreds of ideas correct. they will pick they, they need some way to prioritize which one they're going to invest on right invest right. as in get started and i'm saying there you would intuitively think of the why in your head and sometimes articulating that out uh and validating the why might actually really help you uh, fair enough all i'm saying is that if i have hundreds of ideas i pick bunch of a few bunch which seem uh, uh, uh exciting and i basically try to find online do research market research this that blah 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 and try to find those people so here is the deal 
there is uh, it's supply demand there is or value uh, uh, basically if some if you my principle always has been uh, obviously borrowed from derek severs uh, if you provide value value will come back to you so going along that pushing it little further if you can show some value to some people and get validation that okay you have provided value enough value that they are in return willing to compensate you in whatever manner you absolutely chose. as long as that that happens i wonder the, so the question here why, why? The, the question is that if if you can add value people will add, will give you back no, value not that question. and, that's and an we get that right but no no that's hang on let me complete I'm let me complete hang on let me complete don't jump uh so Uh, if I show a value, if I get enough uh, feedback that I am adding value to that person, my question is: if I get enough feedback from many people that they are willing to buy this product or willing to pay for this product, for that you need to why ideate. I need why is my question. For that you need to ideate the product, right? If if I have to go and approach you saying, "Hey, I'm building this. This is going to add value to you." tell me if this ad going is going to add value or not for that i need to ideate and think about the product correct i mean right? uh, every time uh, when i said i have hundreds of ideas i meant that oh, every idea was okay wow this could really be valuable oh wow this could really be valuable so today the, this uh, if i have to do this this so there is so much problem or i see people around and i see oh they, they are facing so many problems that's where my hundreds of ideas are coming from correct all i'm saying is i pick bunch of them and i do my validation niche validation from uh many people and if they are willing to pay if they are willing or some some sort of uh, feedback i get that they are, they are willing to pay for it then why i have to worry about why is what i am wondering because if validating and ideating is a long process and we are trying to find out a cheaper way of validating and ideating even before you go that's a second step to me the first step is to figure out the why and see if people connect with your why and then you can keep pivoting till you actually add real value to people provided yeah. you can get the why quickly it seems like two orthogonal concerns to me actually fair enough but i think kalpesh to your point where you're getting is you're going to run out of steam with a certain idea with a certain thing and maybe you will drop off but if if the why is connected then you know you could keep adding new things beyond it all right uh, we need to I think what you're talking about is uh, once you have the product. I'm saying even much earlier, right? So why is important when you have the product and you need to decide between ten features which one you will do, whether you'll not do. I'm saying even before starting, right? There is a implicit why in the heads of the creators, uh, and I'm saying if they could articulate that and connect and validate the why, then that would help them actually. build something much more meaningful is my hypothesis All right, time out, and we will continue the discussion because the next speaker needs to get on stage. So thank you, everyone.